World in Action presents The Pirates. This is an old-fashioned pirate, 17th century version. And this, a new mod type, 20th century version. This is a 17th century pirate ship, and this is their ammunition. This is a 20th century pirate ship, and this is their ammunition. For the past six weeks, a pirate radio ship has been transmitting pop music for 12 hours each day to the southeast of England. At six o'clock this morning, a second ship came on the air. The pirate ships are causing the Postmaster General a lot of trouble. This is the Postmaster General, the Right Honourable Reginald Bevins, MP. I suppose there's always a whiff of buccaneering and adventure uh, about this sort of thing. And uh, most English people, of course, have got a sneaking weakness for piracy in any form. And of course, I recognise as well as anybody that this kind of thing makes news. But I, I do think we ought to take a pretty cool look at the facts that surround all this business. And that's exactly what we intend to do in tonight's World in Action. As things are now, it's only the strictly non-commercial BBC who can broadcast radio programmes in Britain. The British people, of course, are perfectly at liberty to tune into any other European stations that they feel like. That, of course, includes Radio Luxembourg, which is a strictly commercial organisation. Geoffrey Everett is general manager of Radio Luxembourg in Britain. Now, the precise difference between an operation such as Radio Luxembourg's and the pirate radio ships is simply this, that Radio Luxembourg uh, on 208 metres are operating on a frequency which has been officially allocated to them by the international body uh, responsible for uh, wavelengths. To escape the law, a pirate ship has to do two things. She has to be registered in a foreign country, not bound by international radio regulations, and she has to anchor outside British waters. Radio Caroline, four and a half miles off Felixstowe, was the first of the pirate ships to beam unlicensed pop music over British shores. We found the men behind this scheme in the office of that glossy magazine, Queen just around the corner from the law courts. Jocelyn Stevens, editor-in-chief of Queen magazine, is joint managing director with 23-year-old Irishman Ronan O'Rahilly of the company which sells advertising time for Radio Caroline. Chris Moore is the program controller of Radio Caroline and Ian Ross, sales executive. Ronan O'Reilly, the originator of Radio Caroline, begins at the beginning. The, the Dutch people were responsible for the picking of the vessel to make sure it was... There are a lot of requirements, as you can imagine, that it, it, it has to stand up to certain gale forces off the coast during the winter. Uh, then the, the ship w was brought to Green Ore. We got... Um, complete cooperation over there in Ireland. My father is uh, in the shipping business across channel from Green Ore to Preston. He took the port over from, from the British Railways. It became derelict about 15 years ago, I think it was. And um, he said, he said to us that we wanted a port that was quiet uh, and Green Ore is very quiet, it's hardly ever used, there's very few people around. And we wanted a place that was quiet, so there wouldn't be... We wanted it to be a surprise, uh, we wanted the launching of Caroline to be a surprise, you see? <laughs> <laughs> we brought all the British technicians over, and uh, they did the work there under complete sort of cloak and dagger arrangements. It began, it began to get a little difficult when uh, this 168-foot mast was, 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 uh, was erected. You know, the interesting thing was, was that, that, that Caroline arrived at, uh, off Harwich at 6 p.m. on the Good Friday, which was almost exactly six months after the operation really got underway. 
and uh, put out a test signal at 9 p.m. that night. On Easter Saturday, March the 28th, Radio Caroline's first broadcast descended on Britain like a bolt from the blue. It had been a well-kept secret. But there was another surprise to come. A second pirate radio ship with a different group of backers was nearing completion. This was Radio Atlanta. Alan Crawford, 42-year-old Australian music publisher, is the boss behind this outfit. On his board of directors, you'll find such important citizens as Oliver Smedley, well-known liberal and businessman with interests in city press newspapers. Major G.C. Lomax, publisher and Lloyd's underwriter. And F.V. Broadrib, financial director to a well-known company. The ship on which the Radio Atlanta group pinned their hopes was now in Greenor, the harbour owned by Ronan O'Reilly's father. In great secrecy, we were taken to this port just beneath the mountains of Mourne and 60 miles north of Dublin. Uh-huh, it was the man friends. The 270-ton Mi Amigo is the ship carrying Radio Atlanta. Built in 1921 in Germany, she was used as a coaster until 1961, when a film producer and a Texan millionaire ran her as one of the first pirate radio ships off the coast of Sweden. But in May 1962, the Swedish parliament said no, and Radio Nor was rudely silenced. Now, two years later, she's been fitted out for the same piratical job, this time off Britain. There are eight in the crew, two Dutch deckhands, Lane and Yab, a Polish cook who just escaped from behind the Iron Curtain, another ex-Pole who was chief engineer, a Dutch second engineer called Tony, a radio technician known as Texas, who came from Dallas. A chief mate from Holland. And Mark Odovsky, the captain, who was a British naturalized Pole. When we arrived at Grinor, the Mi Amigo and her crew had already been there five weeks. Recent events at Grinor had begun to put a strain on the relationship between the rival pirate groups Caroline and Atlanta. Patrick Shields, O'Reilly's foreman at Grinor, explains. Well, the Caroline was here first, you see. The, the Mi Amigo lay outside, you see, and she went out. Because we couldn't have three ships in the dock at the one at the same time, you see. As a matter of fact, the, 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 she, did, she, she was anchored outside the Mi Amigo, and she dragged, dragged, she dragged her anchor. You know what I mean? The, the, and she went up on a sandbank. Got her off the sandbank again, all right, on a high tide. Decided to take her in, so they took her in and uh, anchored her in the, in the dock here. Ah, well, it's a good port, you see, and it's, uh, well, you could get them fitted out here, you know. The Radio Atlanta group weren't quite so enthusiastic about Grenoble, Alan Crawford. Oh, yes, it, it, it took a great deal longer than uh, we had hoped because the, uh, there is always a certain anxiety in getting a project like this underway. And uh, I think we merely ran into the happy Irish go lucky uh, way of life there, that's all. And Captain Odovsky. Although I was told we should be there a few days, it, it uh, lasted nearly six weeks. I was staying in Greeno. I had my fill of difficulties there. I, I actually, it, it was the most difficult part of my, of my trip, staying in Greeno. Jocelyn Stevens of Radio Caroline replies. Well, they're just being crybabies, you know, but they've been four and a half years um, trying to get going, apparently. And they arrived, their boat arrived in Greenall way after the Caroline was, 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 was there. Crawford has indeed been on this project for four and a half years. Some newspapers have suggested that he had the idea first and that O'Reilly jumped in ahead of him. 
Crawford puts it this way. Oh, I met Ronan O'Rahilly at the beginning of last year, 1963. We've both given each other a great deal of advice. It could be that I took less of his than he of mine. Ronan O'Reilly puts it this way. I knew Alan because uh, one of the people who had been, uh, you know, you, you, you find out when you start on an operation. The first, the first place I went to was Sweden, in fact. Uh, the first place I ever went to was Sweden. And you find out by going around various people who've been trying to do this. I mean, there have been a number of groups in England who've tried to put commercial radio into operation on this basis. There, there, there can be no copyright on this idea. I mean, there have been 11 commercial radio stations on ships before. And, and it's, it's idiotic to think that it's any single person's idea. It's not an invention. It's, this is a fact. What happens is, is that Renan took this fact and put it into operation. On April the 17th, four weeks after the Caroline set sail, the Mi Amiga slipped away from Greenorm. Officially, her destination was El Perol in Spain. The captain's bosses would reveal the true destination later. No chances were taken. The Mi Amigo was to stay outside British territorial waters for the entire voyage. No contact was to be made with any shore radio station. Every precaution was taken to ensure that Mi Amigo's position and destination remained a secret. As she set out to cross the Irish Sea with a World in Action crew aboard, the Radio Caroline backers were anxiously waiting in London to see where the Mi Amigo would eventually end up. Would she go after their listeners in the southeast area, or would she anchor somewhere off the north? But this was only one of their worries. Official opposition was beginning to harden. Roy Mason, Labour MP for Barnsley, questioned Mr. Bevin several times in the House of Commons about pirate radio ships. The vacillation of Her Majesty's Government has now allowed Radio Caroline to become established, is now allowing Radio Atlanta to start a test transmissions, an audience is being built up, they will be to some extent annoyed, and consequently the government are building up trouble for themselves. The Postmaster General had already replied in the House that he was awaiting the Council of Europe's decision on the best way to legislate against the pirates. He spoke of the action he was taking through the advertisers. Mr. Bevins explained to World in Action. Right now, what is it possible to do here? Well, of course, in the first place, uh, uh, these ventures are bound to rely for their success on the receipt of advertising revenue. If, if they fail to get money for advertising, then these ventures will collapse. And that, of course, is why some time ago, uh, the post office put its point of view to the principal advertising associations, and they, in turn, represented the post office point of view to all the principal advertising firms uh, throughout the country. And I certainly hope myself uh, that the principal advertisers uh, will have no track with these ventures. President of the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising, Brian McCabe. The last communication we received from the Postmaster General was in fact last November uh, concerning other pirate ships. Uh, and on that occasion we passed his observations and his requests to all our members. The major record companies were surprisingly quiet at this time, although there must have been some hurried board meetings to discuss this new threat to their empires. Phonographic Performances Limited talked of issuing writs for breach of copyright. But Harold Walter, general manager of the Performing Rights Society, didn't seem too worried. In our daily business, we have to deal with a very large number of people whose liability to pay our fees is undoubted, but who do their best to evade us. It was therefore very refreshing indeed to find people, businessmen, whose legal liability was of the slimmest, who came forward voluntarily and said they wished to pay our fees. In short, from our point of view, they are very gentlemanly pirates. The 
pirate ships seemed to be having an unexpectedly smooth passage. After their first engagement, they were still intact. By this time, the Mi Amigo had reached Land's End. At 0030 hours on the morning of April the 20th, a loud crack was heard, and the 140-foot mast, nearly as long as the ship itself, began to sway about dangerously. A shackle had snapped, and a mainstay holding the mast had become free. The mast looked as if it might come down at any moment and was swaying sufficiently to affect the steering of the ship. Captain Adowski was therefore forced to enter territorial waters and to anchor just off Falmouth until dawn. Nobody on board was sure what would happen to the Mi Amigo now that she had come within the three-mile limit. To make things worse, a force-aid gale came up in the morning and the mast slipped about more viciously than ever. At three o'clock that afternoon, the Mi Amigo pulled up her anchor and entered Falmouth Harbour to repair her mast. Where are you going? Eight days later at the Waldorf Hotel in London, the Radio Atlanta group proudly announced that the Mi Amigo had anchored three and a half miles southeast of Frinton-on-Sea and not many miles from the Caroline. The two pirate ships were now in direct competition with each other. But are the pirates that we see here in Britain merely frontmen of some bigger organizations? There's still some mystery about who supplies the financial backing for these 20th century buccaneers. To set up this kind of operation and still keep inside the law, you need to form a maze of different companies in numerous different countries. Panama, Ireland, Liechtenstein, Switzerland. We find that we have to have this operation compartmented. By that I mean that the company which I'm with which I'm connected, the uh, selling of the advertising time, has no direct or indirect connection with the other parts of the uh, operation, that is the ship owner or the broadcaster, because uh, under British law, we must not have this uh, connection. Loot and pirates go together. But just how much loot do you need to launch a pirate radio ship and keep her afloat? Yeah, there's about how a quarter of a million pounds, about, basically, mm -hmm. involved in, in, this, in this thing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the uh, owners of the vessel um, must have invested something in excess of a hundred thousand pounds. I don't know the figures, of course. That's their business. And uh, we, we ourselves have a company of um, 150,000 pounds. The one thing one must destroy any, any misconception anyone might have is that, that uh, Radio Caroline is planned by some Mr. Big, you know, lurking in Central Europe with, with a big fat cigar and, and a hundred greasy slaves, you know. Uh, putting this out as a kind of little thing there with a knob here and to make a big coup. There'd been a lot of newspaper gossip about a possible Mr. Big, but as you've just heard Jocelyn Stevens explain, this exotically nonsensical figure never existed. But it still seems likely that a lot of money has been poured into these ships by various foreign businessmen. What made the real businessmen invest in such a perilously do-or-die venture? The dream their eyes are fixed on is no phantom ship. She lies just off Holland. Her name is Radio Veronica. She's the famous pirate radio ship, which after four years of skirmishing with the Dutch government, finally made the pot of gold. It's reckoned that she receives over one million pounds in advertising fees each year. At one time, it looked as if Radio Caroline and Radio Atlanta might survive like Veronica has, and like Veronica do very nicely for her backers. But the pirate life has suddenly started to get rough. This is Radio Atlanta on our very first day, our Champers Day, bringing you brighter broadcasting and the finest sounds around. Miss Suzanne Scott. Oh, let me go, let me go. The major record companies are after the pirates' blood for using their discs. Radio Caroline defies the record companies by playing her discs direct from sea. Radio Atlanta by taping her programs on shore. World in Action was allowed to film this taping session only if we promised not to reveal where it took place. I am a music publisher and I have found that the effect of the BBC monopoly is uh, 
unacceptable because it perpetuates the monopoly of the large record companies. And uh, I'm afraid that to me a monopoly is something to be fought, not to be accepted. At the present time, there are only two outlets in sound broadcasting into England. One, of course, is the BBC, and the other is Luxembourg. Luxembourg is commercial, and the cream time of Luxembourg is held by all of the major record companies. The third and alternative outlet, such as a radio ship, arrives on the scene. Uh, it can be appreciated how very undesirable this would be from the major record company's point of view, because um, they cannot control it. The major record companies agree with Mr. Crawford. They find it very undesirable. On Friday, May the 1st, they acted. The Queen office had a visitor. Notice of writs were served on almost everybody concerned with Radio Caroline for breach of the Copyright Act. Within the next few weeks, the pirates may well be fighting their first major battle here in the High Court of Justice. <laughs> But the second and more deadly salvo against the pirates was being loaded here. Roy Mason, MP. From Parliament's point of view, uh, this is a strong reason why these pirate radio ships must be outlawed completely. And that is, in our country, as we've allowed television and broadcasting to develop, and as we've allowed advertising on uh, independent television, we have established a code of conduct not only for programs, but particularly for advertisements. But the dangerous aspect of this is that they can advertise uh, products that we ban on our television programs, drugs, pet pills, dangerous to young people. Now that is, a, in, in our opinion anyway, uh, a very strong reason why these pirate ships should be outlawed. The man who could really outlaw the pirates is the Postmaster General. Some people think that we ought to turn a blind eye to this and allow these ventures to continue, uh, hoping uh, that they will provide a, a reasonable service of broadcasting for the public. Uh, but my own conjecture is that if uh, the government acquiesced in what is happening, uh, then we should soon find our shores uh, ringed by an armada of pirate radio ships uh, with all the consequential dangers of which I've already spoken. Interference with home programs and uh, the risk to human life. Today, Radio Atlanta made her first pirate broadcast. Today, the Council of Europe debated illegal broadcasts. Today, MPs and other top people who support commercial radio continue to press their claims. Today, in the Commons, the Postmaster General said he could not add to his earlier statements on possible legislation about the pirates. Whether or not the pirate ships will be silenced is still in doubt, but they certainly won't go down without their colours flying. They have at least proved that over 7 million people in Britain will listen to a programme of continuous music. World in Action leaves you with a final salvo from each of the main contestants. But let's be quite clear about this, of course. The <clears throat> pirates of 1964, like the pirates of old, are simply after money, as much money as they can get, and in defiance of international law. The man from Whitehall who knows best is someone I really detest. You know, okay, there's the, you know, two million people are wrong. This is bad for you. Yeah.